Welcome to the Tennis IQ Podcast. I'm Josh Berger. And I'm Brian Lomax. And today we want to talk about some ways to help you improve your results. Everybody would like that. How would you like to have even better focus? Or how would you like to be able to manage your emotions better during a match? So we've got some ways of doing that that we want to talk about today. And they have to do with routines. Or not both, but actually, I think we're going to talk about three categories of routines. We're going to talk about pre-performance routines, which for a lot of us is going to be pre-match types of things. Um, in-match or in-performance routines, which will probably be the in-between points routine mostly. Uh, and then post-performance, post-match routines. What can we be doing there, especially? In, in all of these, we're going to especially be looking at the mental side of the game. Uh, the emotional side of the game, so things like focus, confidence, emotional regulation, etc. Um, and you know, Josh and I, we've been really thinking a lot about this recently because we've been doing some presentations for USPTA New England, and we're both like, just at least currently, we're kind of immersed in this whole routines thing. So we thought it would be a great idea to, to to share this with all of you because I think even just from our own personal experiences. They have helped with results. They have helped with focus and emotional regulation, and mental preparedness, etc. So, Josh, let's begin with um, pre-performance, pre-match routines. Um, I'd love to hear your take on, you know, what do you think are some important aspects of that? When does it begin for you? You know, when you're when you're training uh, players. Um, yeah, just just give me give me some of your highlights on on pre-performance routines. Yeah, so for me, um, when it comes down to routines in general, I mean, the more that we can automate the process, the more that we can have it be automatic and it doesn't have to be a decision whether it's taking place or not, the more likely it actually is to take place and the more mental space that we have to actually perform the action. Um, so to, to me, as it, when, when we start to break this down this topic um, into pre-match or pre-performance routines, um, I think it varies from player to player. For some player, that'll be maybe an hour before the match when um, they put on a certain playlist that helps to put them in, you know, the, in that right mindset that they want to be in going into the performance. Um, maybe for some players, it's regripping their rackets or uh, you know, j- jumping rope for a few minutes or w- whatever it may be. Um, I also think for for some people, uh, you know, a, a certain part of that can take place earlier, can take place the night before. Maybe there's a visualization process that a player likes to go through the night before in terms of how they want to be playing, um, you know, a certain style, how they want to be behaving and acting on the court. Um, so I, I think uh, generally it starts, you know, shortly before the match, maybe an hour before um, or a couple hours before. It can also take place in that drive to the match. Um, either, you know, player drives themselves or maybe they'll you know, go with friends or, you know, high school or college format. Maybe it's a bus, but, um, to, to me that match and really that, that pre-match routine can start a, a good bit before the match as you start to mentally start to ready yourself for that performance. Yeah, I think that's true. I, I'll probably going to be a little bit more prescriptive on this, yeah. um, you know, I, I do think that there are certain activities that should occur the day before. Mm-hmm. Um, if it's a big tournament that somebody's playing, I'll actually talk about the week before. But a lot of that's just staying focused on the fundamentals. And I like to think of four different areas that a player should think about, you know, quote unquote, warming up. Or at least kind of getting in themselves in the right state. And I think... As you hear these, you'll probably recognize where players are often weak. So I think number one, the thing that you want to make sure is that your physical energy is where you need it to be when you hit the court. And so there are different things that go into that. Obviously, sleep. So if you're playing, you know, if you've got a big event next Saturday or whatever, you've got to be making sure every night you're getting a good night's sleep. It's certainly the night before. The other, another aspect of, of physical energy is your nutrition and your hydration. So you want to make sure that not only you're eating the right things, but you're timing that. So, you know, for example, um, and you probably did this as well at Sacred Heart, Josh. Um, 
when you are timing the team's pre-match meal. It ideally should be somewhere like two and a half to three hours before you're going to play. Right. And then you're going to give yourself maybe some, you know, depending on the player, they may have some snacks or whatever ready, you know, during the warm up or something. So you want to be able to do that. You want to make, so you, that's why I think day of, I like to start it like three hours ahead so that they can plan that piece of it. Um, so, and then it's about the warm up. You mentioned, you know, jumping rope, the, the, the dynamic warm up, right? Getting yourself ready, hitting if you can. Obviously, depending on whatever type of match you're playing or league you're in, court availability, you know, is obviously going to be different. So some, some players may be able to warm up, some cannot, or they may have to do it at a different club. So there's that, you know, getting yourself warm piece of things. I think the next area that we want to look at that we have to warm up per se is your focus, you know, and writing down your focus goals. And I think that's actually a good day before activity, you know, um, using something like a match worksheet or a training journal, write down two to three process goals that you want to have. Or um, alternatively, talk to your coach the day before and write those things down. So that you guys are agreeing on a game plan and a strategy that you want to execute. That way, the next day, it's just about reviewing those. You don't have to like craft that and feel stressed like, oh, I don't know what I'm going to focus on today. You already did that the, the, the night before and you can kind of go to bed knowing that that's, that's taken care of. Um, you mentioned visualization. You know, that could be used as a focus activity. It could be used as some other activity. Meditation maybe the night before or, or the morning of, of your match can certainly help. Um, I think the third category I like people to really be focusing on is their, their motivation and their intensity. You know, are there some things that you can be doing to get yourself geared up to uh, put this match in the right perspective so that you feel motivated to play, right? Thinking of competition as a means of improving your game. You know, uh, I have athletes often write an essay called Why I Compete. Great time to, to review that. Why? you know, or review your overall goal. All right, so how does today's match or tournament fit into that journey? That, right, so that you're setting the proper context. So it's not all about like, I got to win this match and it can help reduce some of that that pressure. But it can then also help you build up the intensity. You know, a lot of players will use things like music yeah. um, or watching videos of tennis. That's something I really like to do. I like to watch, you know, um, I'll watch some Roger Federer hitting one-handed backhands. And that not only gets me kind of pumped to hit one-handed backhands, but it, it sort of lays down a visual blueprint in my mind that I can follow on the court. I can, I can re- run that through my brain. I'll watch videos of Rafael Nadal because I find his style of play to be inspiring and probably the closest to what I do on the court. So th- those are ways for me to boost uh, my intensity and get excited. And then the last one, which I think, Josh, is probably the area where people are weakest in terms of warming themselves up, their confidence and their mood, their positive emotions. So we'll start with that one first because very often people let the whatever's happening that day dictate their mood. Yep, absolutely. Rather than being intentional about setting it. And we all have activities that – get us in a good mood, relax us, et cetera. So, um, you know, it might be watching, you know, something funny on YouTube or on Netflix, just something that takes your mind off things, but, you know, gets you in a good mood. Maybe we do that the night before or watch a funny movie the night before, um, or maybe we do it that day. I've actually done something like that between matches where I had like a huge gap and I could actually go home. So I lived close enough to that, that club. I went home. I had lunch. I watched something funny. I w- it was an experiment to see how this would work. And it worked brilliantly. I went back and I won the next match like 0-0. And, and I was in like such a good, happy, loose, relaxed mood. Um, so there, I think that's important. We're getting ourselves relaxed and in a good mood. We're not stressed about stuff. So that's really important. And then I think your confidence is really big. You know, we, we mentioned that in um, you know, the character – skills of mentally tough competitors, how important confidence and self-belief is. 
And let's face it, many of us start to worry about tournament play or match play and all the potential consequences. And we start to doubt things. So it's really important to to work on your confidence. And that can just be telling yourself that confidence is a choice. It can be visualizing great play by yourself. It might be, uh, you know, affirmations helping you boost yourself uh, in that way. Um, could be looking back at your training journal, your confidence journal, reminding yourself all the work that you've done, all the good things that have been happening over the last few weeks. And, uh, you know, so I think, the idea then is to take a lot of those activities and then somehow schedule them in the, in the run-up to the match. And everything I suggested doesn't take long to do. You know, the physical stuff actually takes longer. You know, a dynamic warm-up probably going to take 10 minutes. Hitting is going to take, you know, if it's a college match, you probably warm up for almost an hour, right? But how long does it take to visualize some things? Not that long. You know, meditation could be five minutes. You know, so we're not talking about items that are like huge time sinks in terms of, you know, investment. So I, I have found that, that, you know, being that deliberate about it and like kind of checking the boxes of these things can really help preparedness mentally. Yeah, there, I, I think there's a lot of good, a lot of good stuff there. Um, I, I, I would agree that, that that last piece, that the, the confidence and the mood um, is is often a bigger variable um, with players where based on, you know, did, did they wake up on the wrong side of the bed? Did, did something happen on the drive over? Somebody cut them off. Yeah. Um, you know, wh- wh- whatever that, that, that last piece can often be a variable. Um, so as, as you said, being intentional with it, setting up processes that, you know, maybe, Maybe it, it is watching that that YouTube video that always puts a smile on your face, or that song that always gets you going. Um, I, I looking back at our um, episode with with Dr. Stephen Walker, um, where he talked about that confidence journal. I think that's a, a great tool players can utilize. Um, I've even heard of players putting together so almost like a highlight reel of themselves. Of uh, you know, if, if a coach or a parent has has uh, done some some video of them, you know, putting together some of their highlights. Um, and watching that prior to a match or watching that, you know, a couple hours before if they're feeling nervous. Uh, but I, I, I would agree being intentional with those aspects just in the same way that more and more players are intentional about their physical warm up of their strokes and of their um, dynamic warm up um, leading up to, to that process. So um, having taking an intentional approach on, you know, putting all of these pieces together, including making sure we're in a good mood, making sure we feel confident making sure we're, we're well rested, well hydrated, have our, our nutrients. I, I think, yeah, I, I, I think you had a lot of good points. I mean, this, this brings us back to, to me, to, to that episode with Dr. Walker yeah. and just really emphasizes how important that, how important that preparation piece is. Um, I mean, there's that famous quote that if you don't, what, what is it? If you, if you don't prepare, uh, another one that. you're thinking of, right? It's like, um, yeah. You know, if you fail to prepare, if you fail to prepare, you prepare to fail or some, right. something like that. Exactly. Um, <laughs> um, but, but anyways, uh, w- without that preparation piece and without putting in processes that, that you can do every single time without even necessarily thinking about them, it's going to make that you, you have to essentially on game day or, or the few hours before the night before you have to think of, okay, what would, what do I need right now? Okay. What, um, okay. What am I going to do for my hydration today? Rather than already having your water bottles set. Um, okay. What, what am I going to bring to the match rather than already having, um, the snacks set up and already knowing what time you're going to eat and what you're planning to eat for that meal. Um, so the more that we can set up, uh, routines and rituals in an orderly way ahead of time, um, actually one, um, this also reminds me of um, the book Winning Ugly, which I know we both think is, you know, an excellent book in terms of tennis and in terms of helping helping players. One of the things I like about that book is the chapter that's all about preparing our back. Yeah. And, you know, th- th- they discuss all sorts of things in terms of having some snacks in there, in terms of having an extra pair of socks, extra pair of shoes, and tells a story in that book. But we need to make sure 
that um, this has all been thought out ahead of time, that we've put in these processes into place um, in, in terms of every piece of it, in terms of preparing our bag, in terms of preparing our body, our mood, our mentality, and, and our strokes. Um, and then also, I, I think another important piece is when it comes to the actual warm up in the match, um, being intentional with that process as well, where, you know, it's, we, we mentioned with college matches, oftentimes it's an hour, but, you know, a USTA match, you go out there, you might have to just go out there with your opponent and hit some balls for five to 10 minutes and be ready to play. So how can we maximize that time where we're getting our body loose, we're getting our strokes warmed up. And while we also being aware of the player on the other side of the court, trying to formulate some sort of game plan, trying to analyze those strengths and weaknesses and see maybe there's a certain shot or pattern of shots that they struggle with. Um, so maximizing that time during the warm up as well, whether it's an hour or whether it's five minutes or, or somewhere in between. So, so being intentional about that and having processes that we, that we go to um, is going to make a big difference in terms of your, your performance. But really to me, it comes down to the consistency of your performance. Yes, exactly. I think that's exactly it, Josh. Is like if you're able to do this type of preparation, you'll find yourself having more consistent performances over time. Absolutely. I mean, anybody to to me, anybody can play well when they're feeling great. When you know, when, when every, everything's in sync, when, when Mercury's in, in retrograde, <laughs> you're right. Every everything's gonna go well. Um, but but. To me, really, where the mental skills comes in, where the preparation, these routines come in, where they're most important is the other, you know, whatever percent of the time, the, the other 95% of the time when not everything is in sync. That's when you really need to rely on these skills. That's when um, it's so important that you, you've you had that quality warm up, that you're feeling hydrated and you, you have a good meal in you. And, be, and doing that every single time that you compete, or at least aiming to do that every time you compete, gives yourself the best possible chance to perform at a high level and will lead to more consistency of performance. For sure. And this discussion is reminding me of a book uh, that isn't a sports book. It's called The Art of War by Stephen Pressfield. And in that book, he talks about the concept of turning pro, which he then, I think, wrote a separate book called Turning Pro. The idea is what we're talking about, and you know, the both of us here, is we're going pro, going professional in our preparation. So even though most people who listen to this podcast are not professional players, that doesn't matter. Some might want to be, but you can't like postpone having a professional pre-match routine until you are a professional. You need to go pro now. And even if you're an adult player, what's wrong really with being a little bit more professional about your preparation? The opposite of that is being an amateur, right? Do you really want to be amateurish about your preparation? If you, you know, and, and I think the thing that we're talking about is the difference here is, is that consistency. You can look at it like those four things I look at it as almost um, like your, your preparation dashboard. And you are the pilot of your own sort of plane, right? So we could talk about like Air Josh, you know, <laughs> and we could look at the dials, right? And if, you know, sometimes it might be like a little bit off. That confidence mood thing might be a little bit low. Like, all right, are we really want to fly? Do we really want to fly Air Josh today? Like, eh. It's not looking that good. <laughs> um, but, you know, if we can get those dials to be like at 100% or close, right? Somewhere in sort of a green zone, you know, 85 to 90% of like what we need them to be, then we're going to have probably more consistent performances. But if, you know, if we're all over the place on those things, um, then we're more likely to have, you know, crash and burn scenarios. Um, so I think professionalism is, you know, actually, as we go through this whole episode, Josh, I think professionalism is actually a really good term to apply to this. Yeah, I, I, absolutely. Um, and I think doing everything, doing everything with intent and doing it like, like a professional doing it in the right way, having a, you know, having it thought out ahead of time. So it's not 
we're not winging it. That there's there's a plan here that we're you're never going to make it to the to Wimbledon or to the Australian Open um, without being a professional and acting like a professional a long time before that. Yeah. So I, I think that's that's a great point. And I think you know uh, many people listening are probably sports fans. You know, one of the things that you showed in your presentation on routines was uh, a pregame ritual that Henrik Lundqvist, formerly of the Rangers, um, goalie for the Ranger, New York Rangers, uh, does before a game, right? And so that's just one example. But if you could watch any uh, professional event and you watch their pregame and what they're doing you're, and then maybe compare that same athlete or same team in another game, you're going to see them doing the same things over and over again. And, and part, I think, why, you know, totally discussed this yet, but routines, you know, why do we as human beings have routines? Very often it's because it's, it's an efficient use of our energy to help us, you know, achieve something or to help us get ready for something. And that's, you know, for all of us, we want to find good routines to help us and we want them to be repeatable so that we can use them over and over and create that consistency create better quality performances, et cetera. So um, even, uh, you know, we've got the Super Bowl coming up this coming weekend. Um, Great opportunity to watch some of these athletes with their pregame routines. You know, you hear about some football players like a Tom Brady getting to the stadium, you know, four, five, six hours before the game. And, you know, and, and there's a, there's a, you know, somebody like Brady who's, you know, a little bit older, he's probably perfected his pregame preparation at this standpoint. Although I bet it's different than it was maybe when he was 22 or 23. And, you know, part of developing a routine is trying things out and reflecting on it and tweaking and continuing to add things as you get smarter and learn more about, you know, Nutrition, energy, et cetera, mental things, you'll, you'll want to try to add and tweak that. But, uh, you know, uh, a player like Tom Brady probably has a very regimented routine now that has helped him, um, you know, stay near the top uh, of the game and, and he's helped his team, you know, get to, get to a Super Bowl. So um, those, are, those could be some things that people watch, you know, when they watch pro sports. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think also as you know, as we start to think about some of the um, in performance or during performance routines, um, r- routines are one of the most visual, one of the most obvious cues to to the fans, to our coaches, um, to the opposing team um, of of our mental readiness, of our mental toughness. Um, going through that process before a point, going through that process before a game shows that we're taking this seriously, that we're ready, that we have a plan, that we're not – to me, if I if I am playing in a match and I look over to the other side of the net and, you know, the, the person is – has their warm-ups on during during warm-up, they're going through the, pro, the, um, the warm-up diligently, they're taking it seriously, they're moving their feet. Then I compare that to um, the Nick Curios approach, we'll say, where somebody's still wearing their their basketball shoes um, leading up to uh, us spinning the racket and they're hitting tweeners during the warm up, not moving their feet. Um, it just it just sends a totally different message to the opponent. And I think fans can certainly pick up on this um, watching the Super Bowl, watching the Australian Open that's coming up. Yeah. Um, And as I said, I think it sends a definite signal to our coaches, to our sports psychology professionals as athletes, that we're taking this seriously, that we're diligently going through this process um, and and trying to do everything that we can to give ourselves the best chance to be successful. I mean, when it it comes to these um, in-between point routines and really in-performance routines, um, especially in a sport like tennis, and we've discussed the, the scoring system and how how challenging it, it can certainly be, um, but losing points is inevitable. You're going to lose right around 50% of points in the course of a season, in the course of a match even. Um, so how can we put in place routines in terms of being able to bounce back from those points lost, being, 
bounce back from those games or sets lost even so that we're able to recover mentally and put ourselves in the best possible space to, to perform well. Yeah. Yeah. So let's jump into, you know, the in-between point routine um, and, and maybe discuss sort of at a high level why it's important. Um, yeah. And, and I, I'll give you my, my views on this because I, I think this is probably one of the most important aspects of being a great competitor in terms of tennis. Um, and I think it comes down to, to me, understanding that the most important point in a match is always the next one. It's the only one you can do something about. Um, and so let's say I say that. Let's say I, I learned to adopt that as my philosophy. Don't I owe it to myself to be 100% physically ready for that point? Mentally ready? Emotionally ready for that point? Um, to me, that's the major purpose of the in-between points routine. Is understanding it's the most important point in the match. And then getting yourself physically, mentally, emotionally ready to play that point the best you can. Of course, then once it's over, it's no longer the most important point. It's now the next one. Yep. And um, that that you know is 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 part of the routine and, and learning to transition that way. Um, but when we can do that, when we can get ourselves a hundred percent ready, point after point after point, we become a relentless competitor. And I think that that's you know we've we've used that word in past episodes. Um, and I think that's one that often is attributed to Rafael Nadal or t- to describe him. Other players have described him as being relentless because of this, because he's giving his all every single point. And this is how we as players learn to do that better, is first of all, value it that it is the most important point of the match. And secondly, you owe it to yourself to be ready for the most important point of the match. You would not want to tell your coach at the end of a match, well, you know, I just wasn't really ready for the most important points of the match. Um, that's not a good thing to have to say. So we want to make sure that we are we are getting there. And then, of course, we can get into the, the um, logistics of it because that's important as well because um, we are going from point to point to point. Um, so, Josh, if you don't mind, I'd like to hear, you know, your take on the in-between, maybe some of the logistics or, or what I just said, um, because I think um, it would be worthwhile at least sharing some models of what an in-between points routine looks like. Yeah, yeah, I, I think you brought up a, a great point in terms of that the next point is is really the most important point. It's really the, the point that deserves our focus going into uh, when we're going into it. If we're... We're not doing that next point justice if we're focused on the, the previous point that where we hit an unforced error. We're not doing that point justice if we're thinking about how we're upset about the lineup. Uh, we're not doing that point justice if we're our, if our mental energy is focused on whether or not our opponent is cheating um, or, or anything like that. We're, we're doing uh, that point justice and we're doing ourselves justice by putting everything possible into that next point, by being as physically and mentally ready for that next point. Um, so um, the way that I, I mean, I, I know we've d- discussed this a lot over the last few days um, with the USPTA New England uh, Sports Psychology Summit, um, but, you know, you, you utilizing uh, Jim Lear's 16-second cure is, is de- definitely a good place to start in terms of, in terms of the logis- logistics, in terms of, how do we maximize that time? And it's generally about 20 seconds um, from the time a point ends until the time the next point starts. But how can we maximize how we're using that time regardless of what happened in the previous point? Maybe we hit a huge winner to win, to win, um, you know, to, to win the game, to win the set, um, or the exact opposite of that. Um, but how can we have a systematic approach to uh, to to giving us the best possible chance to perform well in that most important point of the match. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, let's, let's maybe get into some logistics of it 
as well. I, I have actually been more recently thinking about the routine in two parts. Um, one is a post point and one is a, a, a pre point. And the, the reason this came up, at least in the last few months, is that um, we pay a lot of attention, I think, when we're talking about the routine to the post point self talk, and which we should. Um, because very often what happens after a point um, could be some celebration, could be completely neutral, could be very critical. Um, and very often we sort of just let that self-talk stand on its own. When in reality, if we break up this into two phases, which could have also phases below it, I suppose, um, you know, which Lair talks about four things. I think Larry Lauer at USTA Player Development also has four stages. I think it's very similar to Lair, but they call it the four R's. Um, but if we even think about like post point, pre point, to me, the post point is about getting yourself kind of, it's recovering and relaxing, getting your heart rate down. The pre point is getting yourself geared back up. Yep. And it's calling a play, having an intention about what you're going to do on that next point. And I think we should focus more on on some of that pre-point self-talk. And this came up actually recently with a, a player that I work with. It's a national level player. And she was losing focus in certain points. And then we looked at times when she didn't. And she noted that on those points, she actually had a very, she was saying some things to herself and she was tapping her thigh and it's like, well, hmm, well, perhaps we should put that into place more. Yeah. Um, obviously it's one of those areas where success leaves clues. So we picked up a clue there. Um, and instead of making that random, let's make that a little bit more part of your, your routine. And actually that helped pick up her quality of play just by adding more specific um, planned pre-point self-talk. And it was very, it, was, it wasn't, it was you know, deep and profound. It was you know, more like, you know, okay, let's go, come on. But it was, it was when it was said. Um, because, you know, if you listen to a, like, a college match, you can hear let's go, come on frequently after a point. And it's all about celebrating the last point. But what if you say let's go, come on, right before you start a point. You have very interesting implications and, and something to consider as we go through, you know, helping people design their own in-between point routine. Yeah, yeah, I, absolutely. I think, um, and we'll, we'll definitely talk about the, the different phases of this, but I think that that last phase, um, to me, again, using utilizing the, 16 second cure sort of that that ritual stage where we're, we're actually going into the serve we're going into the yeah. return motion and uh, our ritual for that for that stroke um utilizing some sort of simple self-talk or some sort of simple cue um, it could be something motivational something like let's go come on um this point something like that it could be um, some sort of physical reminder like moving our feet like bringing that intensity um, utilizing the legs on the serve. Um, but no, I, I, I definitely would emphasize that utilizing self-talk um, in either a more instructional or motivational manner is, is pivotal, especially going right into that point. Um, I, I, I also think, you know, you, you broke it down into post point and pre point. Um, and I, I think that that is a good way to think about it because um, and and th this can start to you know to sort of start the discussion on those those different stages, but as as the point ends, there needs to be we can't just be moving right on to the next one. There has to be some sort of reflection stage or some sort of um, positive response, um, and we have to at least acknowledge okay what what happened here. And we're aiming for that neutral response or some sort of positive response. Um, and that can be, that's both with our body language and that's both with our behavior. Is that a come on, let's go? Is that a, um, a fist pump? If the other player hit a nice shot, are we saying nice shot? Or, this, or are we saying, oh, that's so lucky? 
Um, are we, uh, you know, if, if we miss a shot, how can we be neutral or positive in that moment, right? Maybe I, I think a good way to do that is a shadow swing after the fact to reinforce the way that we want to hit that sh- that stroke, um, or even no re- no uh, no reaction whatsoever, and instead just choosing to you know exhibit positive body language and walk with our shoulders back and our you know our head held up high, being ready for that next point. Um, so 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 to me, as as we start this process, thinking about the post point. Um, thinking about the immediate follow-up from from the previous point, um, that's you know that that those are a couple of the the most important pieces between the um, the behaviors that that, have, that take place as well as as the body language. Yeah. So if we break down the the layer, um, sixteen second cure, right? So first phase is that positive physical response, which you just described. Um, and there might be some mechanics in there too. You know, you, you actually mentioned this in your presentation, you know, and I think I did too on mine, um, you know, taking the racket out of your dominant hand, right. Putting it in your non-dominant, yep. um, giving some relaxation to your dominant arm. You, know, you don't want to be carrying that racket and gripping it all day. A lot of tension can build up there. Um, and I th- that, so that's that positive physical response. The second phase is what we would call the recovery relaxation phase. Um, and we have often talked about the benefits of breathing with respect to performance, to calming ourselves down, reducing anxiety, also inducing a relaxation response. So this is an opportunity to do belly breaths or diaphragmic breathing so that you can begin to relax yourself, get the heart rate down. But as you're walking, you know, to either to pick up a ball or you're going to your towel, you're still displaying that great body language, still showing, you know, a level of confidence and power. I'm still in this. I'm still fighting. I'm still competing. Um, I think, you know, many, you know, Lair makes the point and many others make the point that it's between points where your mental toughness is revealed. And you, you said it, Josh, people can watch your body language and it is a window into your emotional state. Um, and you're, you know, we call it body language for a reason. It is a language. It communicates. What do you want to be communicating to the world, but also to yourself? Because what you're doing physically will have, you know, some body chemistry impacts, and they will have some psychological impacts. So that second stage, really important to get that breathing down. It's, you know, um, we talked about mindfulness in one of our previous episodes. So it's almost like a little mindfulness moment there, um, you know, where we're choosing to respond, not react. Um, and, and if we can get the heart rate down and calm ourselves down, what we're ending up doing is helping our brain be more perceptive, to think more clearly, to be better at problem solving, which is going to help for the next two stages of the routine. Absolutely. And uh, I guess I sort of, the way that I sort of view it is, um, again, thinking about it in terms of post-point and pre-point, um, that, that second stage, that relaxation stage is almost in between. Um, you could you could say it's, it is maybe part of the, the post-point that we're, you know, relaxing from that point and coming back into that present moment. But I, you know, if, if we're thinking pre and post, to me, that's almost, sort of in between in terms of the, you know, the, the present. So we're, we're reflecting on that, that last point and responding in a physical, physically responding, you know, in a, in the way that we want. And then we're coming back into this moment, into this present moment through the, through the breath and through that relaxation stage. And then we're going into these later stages, which uh, that's the, the, that third stage is the preparation stage where we go into um, actually coming up with, an intention and a plan for the following point. Um, so, you know, if it, we, we were starting with that server return and that that's going to, you know, generally start with, okay, what, did, where do we want to go with the serve, right? Having a clear plan for our serve, our return, and that's serve plus one or return plus one, really focusing on those first, those first few shots. Um, Cause we know that most points are actually quite short. So really trying to be precise and intentional about those few, first few um, first few shots 
that we're going to be hitting. Maybe it's a certain pattern that we like to, to utilize, um, a favorite play, um, you know, especially on a big point. Maybe there's a certain play that we like to use every time um, that's going to give us that added confidence because based on us doing it over and over again. But um, that, that next step after the re, uh, positive response stage, after the relaxation stage, is, is starting to prepare for that following point. Um, and, you know, really being clear, having a clear intention going into that point. This is huge. Yeah, and it's like calling a play in football. Mm-hmm. When, you know, a football team gets in a huddle, at least on offense, they're not talking about what they're going to do for dinner after the game. They're talking about, you know, what is the plan here? And it's it's not about to say, you know, all right, you receivers just go out and I'll find you. They are they're executing a play that they've actually been practicing all week. Yep. And they have full confidence in that because they've been practicing that play. So, you know, these might be patterns or plays that we've practiced a lot. Um, and what that does is it helps us during a point where we don't have to make so many decisions. We can, um, you know, simply execute the play that we called. Now, similar to football, uh, your opponent may blow up your play. So that's going to happen. So you may have as a default, let's say, you know, you're serving and you're serving out wide and you're hoping to get a ball somewhere in the middle to drive it to, um, you know, the ad side corner. Um, But your opponent hits a great return cross court like an angle. All right, what's plan B? Right. Maybe plan B is all right. No matter what, I go high and cross court just to get myself back neutral. Right. So, again, that way you, you have something to just fall back on in terms of. So I think this is a, a, a piece of like when I've worked with athletes on this, this is probably the piece that people fall down on the most. They don't call the play. Kind of skip this piece. And I think intention is a huge uh, you used that word in your presentation, Josh, and it was really good for that. Because I think we have to go into a point with an intention. We almost have to go into every shot with a very clear intention. You know, when we had Bill Tim on, that he's very clear about, you know, how focus and intention play a part in unforced errors, right? If you don't have enough focus on the ball, or if you don't have enough intention about your targets, those things result in unforced errors. And we're obviously, part of our game is to reduce our unforced errors. So that that's a that's a really important part. So then the last phase of the routine is what's called the rituals phase. And and very often if you were to ask somebody who doesn't really know what an in-between points routine is, say, all right, tell me about your in-between point routine. I've had many people say, well, you know, I bounce the ball, you know, five or six times. And they start there. Yep. Right? They don't really look at anything else before that. And that's like, all right, yeah. That is a part of your in-between point routine, but it's, it's a ritual piece. And the ritual here, I think, is about getting yourself into the right sort of state and rhythm before you play. Um, and that's why a lot of players will bounce the ball a few times. It's just to kind of like, and I know I do this. I, I don't have a specific number that I do. I kind of do it to a place where I, I feel right. And then I go. Now, others may be different. Others may say, you know what? I like to bounce the ball six times, and then I go. Um, it doesn't matter what it is, but it's, it's, it's about you feeling like you're ready to go at that point. And it, we want it to be repeatable each time. Um, that's one of the sort of powerful aspects of routines is that the more that you are consistent with it, the more repeatable it is, the, the, be- the greater the benefit for you as an athlete. We'll certainly see this with, as we kind of wrap up the in-between points piece. Um, So lots of players already have serve rituals. This is probably the easiest part of the routine to train because most people already do it. Um, Although on the return side, I would say most players don't have um, as much consistency to what they do there. I don't know if you found that, Josh, and that that to me has been a a consistent theme. And it doesn't need to be... uh, elaborate again it could be something as simple as maybe you turn the grip of your racket maybe you touch your racket to the ground maybe you just bounce up and down and breathe before you get into position um, it doesn't have to be again elaborate 
Um, but something that you want to be able to repeat so that when you do step into position, you feel locked in, like yep. you're, you're ready to go. Um, I have found having players do um, what I call like a breathe, bounce, ready has been effective. So they take a breath as they're you know just about to get into that return position. They bounce up and down a few times, and then they step into their position almost like a you know in baseball a batter getting into the batter's box. And then that kind of that that transition right there gets them a little bit more locked in into that. So what are your thoughts on on rituals, Josh? Yeah, I think it's um, I think it's an important piece. I would I would agree that most players don't have a clear plan as much with with um, the return ritual. Um, I, I, I like I like that suggestion that, that you have. Um, and I, I mean, I, I think, you know, again, I'll bring up the, the self-talk piece during this stage. Yeah. Um, you know, that this is immediately following the preparation stage where we're talking about, you know, having a clear plan. Um, for the point. And I think, you know, u- utilizing just a, just really brief self-talk at, the, at this stage in terms of following through with that. So maybe our plan, maybe it's a second serve return and we want to try to be aggressive and follow that shot into the net. Um, so it's, you know, go for it where maybe it's a first serve return and we want to um, hit the ball deep down the middle and it's, you know, let's be solid here. Um, so it's a, it's a different mindset that we need to have. Um, and I, I think uh, Djokovic is a, is a great person to look at, to, to look at in terms of his um, serve return routine. Um, in terms of you can watch it, it is similar to that Henrik Lundqvist video where I think if you watched him prepare to return serve every single point, it looks quite similar. Yeah. Uh, so being able to do something that's rep- replicable um, is, is going to help you feel more locked in point in and point out and it doesn't matter it doesn't matter what the score is that's that's again um talking about rafael nadal um what, what a lot of people say about him what what makes him so solid um yes sure he's his you know forehand and the different aspects of his game are are awesome but he plays every point the same way and that doesn't happen by accident there's a process that 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 um that that requires you're not going to play every point the same way if you're hung up on the last point. You're not going to play every point the same way if your heartbeat is variable, is so variable because you haven't incorporated any breathing leading up to it. You're not going to play the same point the same way if you haven't split stepped um, before as you're about to return serve because you're not going to be ready. Or if you bounce the ball sometimes once and other times 20 times. Um, and so, so doing these things over and over again are going to give you that confidence, um, and and help you feel ready because you've performed that action over and over again in big moments. Um, if you think, think back to a break point or a deuce point, you want to be able to pull from that confidence of performing that action time and time again. Um, and those, to me, that those are really some of the moments where, um, you need to be utilizing your routines. And also, I mean, and we can bring this up as well, um, you know, a, a, apart from just the standard run of the mill points, having some sort of yellow light routine or some sort of uh, routine that we can refer to in those moments, whether it's a break point or it's love 30, or we just double faulted, uh, hit a couple unforced errors in a row, whatever it may be. Uh, but having sort of a yellow light routine where it's okay. Uh Oh, let's slow down. Let's um, let's be again. I'm going to use the word intentional with our approach here. Maybe it's you know reminding ourselves to move our feet. Maybe it's that remind. Maybe what's needed is that reminder to move on from the following from the previous point. Um, but to have a separate sort of routine, um, maybe it's wiping, going to our towel and wiping off our face. But having some sort of separate routine apart from this. Um, this model, which which is which is excellent, definitely a great framework um, that we can utilize during those moments where we where we really need it most. Yeah, and I think um, you know going back to what you're saying about the pros and how they they understand what's happening, they understand that you know as we said earlier, the most important point of the match is the next one, but they also get that they're never out of a match unless yep. match point has been played, it's not over. 
And the only thing that's changing from point to point to point is probability. The probability of one player winning versus another. And because tennis is generally not timed, you're never at zero unless it's over. Um, you know, in Djokovic versus Federer at Wimbledon 2019 is a great example where Federer is up 40-15 on his serve, serving for the match. Djokovic's probability is probably fairly low in that moment. Uh, he hadn't even been really returning well that particular day, but he ends up winning that game, wins the match, wins fewer points than Federer, um, but win, you know, wins the Wimbledon title. Um, and so... You know, I think, what's the overall benefit to doing this? In, in my opinion, if you are able to implement this, really integrate it into your game, what I think you can expect to see is that you will play more quality points than you do today. And if you are able, let's say you play, you know, 10 points and out of those 10, you play five good ones just in general. Well, what if we were able to get you to play six or seven out of 10? Would that have an effect on your results? I'm pretty sure it would. I'm pretty sure that you just having two out of every 10 points being better quality tennis would have a definite impact on your results. I know I've personally seen that. Um, so to me, that's the big selling point is this can help you be more consistent in your performances, but also raise the quality of your play from point to point to point. Um, you may actually find that you win faster by taking more time in between points. Now, that may sound sort of like paradoxical, but I was talking to a student the other day who was telling me about how you played this really long deuce game. And then he was using his in-between point routine basically only on add-out. <laughs> um, and he won all the add-out points and then eventually won the game. And he's like, yeah, it took like 10 or 12 points. I was like, well, what do you think would have happened if you'd used the, the routine on every point? He's like, oh, that's a good question. I probably would have won the game a lot faster. And that's, you know, that's generally what happens, I think, in tennis matches is that as players, we – we play some good points and we play some bad points. And it sort of adds up to like what you were saying, Josh. We win 50%, lose 50%. But what if we could just change that ratio just a little bit? To me, this is this is like the secret ingredient to doing that. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a great point. And I, I brought up in my presentation um, some of the research from, from Craig O'Shaughnessy um, that I'm, I'm sure some of our listeners have seen before showing that uh, – the, the, the best players in the world, the, the Djokovic's, the Federer's, and the Dahl's, they don't win 70% of their points or 80% of their points. Um, the, the, the research showed, I think it was between 2015 and 2019, all three of them were somewhere between 54 and 55% of, of points won over the, over the course of those, those years. Now, that's, that, that's, a, that's a pretty big sample size there. And the difference between a player who's maybe ranked between 10 and 50, um, I think Feliciano Lopez, Nick Kyrgios, there are some other players in there um, who are maybe between 49% and 51% of points won. So we're not talking about a huge gap here. We're talking about, you know, four, four to, to six points, really. Um, so it's, it's how can we, you know, what are those small differences that we, that we can make um, to to bridge that gap. Uh, to me, that the in between points, the um, pre match, um, the, these things that maybe seem minor in the moment, they they certainly add up. Um, the, these what, these tiny differences, these one percent differences or one percent habits. We've talked about atomic habits in this this concept before, but um, these these small changes really make a huge difference. And, you know, the, the player that's going about this routine every single point or at least aiming to every single point and the player that never does or only does it occasionally when they think about it, 
Um, it, that, that difference over the course of a match, over the course of a season or a career, it, it adds up. It, it, it compounds and it multiplies. For sure. So, you know, I, th- I think this is uh, one where if, if listeners have questions beyond like what we talked about, feel free to email us at tennisiqpodcast at gmail.com. So let's let's talk about post-match, Josh. Yep. So match is over. Um, certainly, you know, a lot of players will have some sort of physical routine afterwards, whether that be stretching, foam rolling, other forms of therapy. You know, lots of college teams may end up in the in the trainer's room doing some massage or ice baths or or, or whatever. Um, but there's a mental component to um, post performance, and I think that that often gets lost. And um, I know for the players I work with, there are a couple things that I like them to do, and I think we're you and I are in line on this. One of them is you know is let's let's reflect on what just happened, um, and I think it's important to you know provide players with a framework of you know what they should reflect on, as well as give them some. You know, there's other things, but I like to go with um, essentially like I think four or five questions. You know, first off is, all right, what went well? What did you do well in this match? And this can kind of help towards the the Steve Walker confidence journal. Also, is that let's start with the good things, you know, so that we're you know, we're kind of even if it was a terrible loss, you know, right? You showed up on time, probably something like that, right? And we always do something well in a match. Um, second, what would be, okay, what could have been better? What needs work? Um, and again, we're looking at it from a neutral perspective. We're not saying, you know, what was awful, what was terrible. It's just like, you know, what, what needs some work? What could have been a little bit better out there? Um, I think it's important to look at what were some positive adjustments that you made in the match? Again, we're looking toward building confidence, building some self-efficacy. Hey, Good job. You solved that problem. You made an adjustment here. Maybe maybe you'll realize you made it too late, but at least you, you tried something. So there might be some adjustments that you made. Uh, another question I like to ask is, if you could play this match again, what would you do differently? Um, and there probably should be some things. Even if you won the match, you might say, "Hey, I I might have tried to come to net more. You know, I was you know it was just, I was just." basically grinding from the baseline. It was too easy. Something like that. Okay. And then the last bit would be, um, what did you learn today, either about yourself or about your tennis game that you can take forward into your next match or into your next week of practices? Um, and this is often the, to me, the golden question, Josh, like when I look at the match worksheets that players fill out, get some really good stuff here. And it often will end up being like the theme of like our next session right. with the player to kind of let, Hey, let's dive. Like, how did you figure that out? What, you know, is that something we should be focusing on more in practice, et cetera? Um, all right. We should tell your other coaches and so forth. Um, so I think that's uh, to me, that's um, something players can do. It doesn't have to be right after a match. Um, I think there should dep- it depends on your emotional state. You might be really upset, and perhaps that's not the time to be doing a deep debrief on that. You may want to settle down where you can, uh, you know, um, be a little bit more analytical later and and get your thoughts out. But I think the act of writing things down can help bring some clarity and insight. We don't have so many ideas rattling around in our head that way. I think that's, you know, why people talk about journaling and reflection in general, um, that the brain is not necessarily a great storage area. Like let's put that in our journal. Um, the brain is much better at creating ideas and creativity and, and generating ideas. So let's give it the mental space to do that by, you know, doing almost this reflection dump into, into a journal. So I don't think it has to occur right away, but it probably should occur within 24 hours. We don't have, want to have too much of a memory decrement. Um, you know, like doing it a week later, you're probably going to forget a lot of things that went. So what are some questions that you like to ask your players after a match, Josh? 
Yeah, well, I, th I think you, um, I, I would start by saying, I think you, you bring up an important point in terms of the timing, um, where right after the match, especially if a player lost or they're frustrated, didn't play well, most players are not going to be in the space to put together anything of value on paper, at least from my experience. They're going to be... Or, or in conversation. Or in conversation. Most most players need a little time um, where their people are going to be beating themselves up, uh, catastrophizing, thinking that they're the worst in the world. I can't believe I lost to this person. My backhand is the worst or whatever. I'm sure, I'm sure our listeners have heard, have heard that. They maybe have said that. I've, I've said that plenty. Um, so right after the match generally is not the best time, but also we don't want to wait too long um, so that we sort of forget some of these uh, important details where, you know, I'm sure you won't forget the feeling that you had after that match, whether, whether it was a positive or negative or somewhere in between, but um, some of these, you know, minor details or important details, but smaller details um, in terms of, you know, as you said, the takeaways, um, in terms of what you do differently, um, in terms of maybe or something about the other player that you didn't notice, um, these things will fade over time. So I, I like that that guidance in terms of somewhere around 24 hours is good. I, I often think, you know, trying to get it done by the end of the day, um, ideally, again, doesn't always happen, is, is, is a, a good rule of thumb because it's still, you know, Ideally, it's been a few hours. You can reflect. You're in a better place to reflect, but also it's still fresh in your mind. And then once that once that match report or once that that journal entry has taken place, then you can move on from it. But it's if you wait too long, it's almost hanging over your head, and you can't really put that match behind you, especially if it was um, more of a negative one. Um, I, I I like to. I, I would say I go through a, a similar process. Um, trying to think, and I, I think this is the case whether it's a match um, or even or even practice. You could you could go through a similar process um, of going through those things that you did well, going through what you'd like to do differently, um, some sort of takeaways. And there's a sports psychology professional. I think I I, I think it's I think it was Billy Billy Holiday of uh, the world of baseball actually who came up with this three two one that he would do with three things that went well, two things that didn't go so well, and one takeaway. Um, and trying to get into that habit of doing it um, on a daily basis to, to start to reinforce you know, th that, that reflection process. And I think that's, that's certainly something you we can do with a match. I also think trying to um, – a, a lot of players end up playing opponents over and over again. Um, it might be – the next week, the next weekend at the tournament, it might be a few months down the road, even a few years down the road, but oftentimes you will end up crossing paths with that opponent again. So um, I, I think that's a good point that you made in terms of what would you do differently? Because oftentimes that can be something very helpful to look back at. If you do play that same opponent again, um, or maybe certain notes about, about them and their playing style. Um, but I think starting to instill that that reflection process um, and, and making that a routine, making that a habit, um, is going to, going to help our players also analyze the game better um, because they're analyzing their themselves, you know, their strokes on that particular day, their mindset on that particular day, whether they were utilizing in between point routines, how did they warm up, what was their process leading up to the match, um, so analyzing all of these steps about themselves, analyzing their opponent. Um, as well, maybe analyzing the condition. Maybe it's particularly windy day or sun was bad on one side. Did did we do enough to um, adjust to that? Um, did, did we do enough to consider the, the circumstances of the match? Um, so I, I think this process is, is very helpful in terms of um, helping our players become more analytical players and ultimately smarter smarter players, more students of the game. Yeah, and I think um, as you were talking, it reminded me. I believe Brad Brad Gilbert talks about having a separate journal just dedicated to your opponents, right? As a scouting report thing. And um, I think one thing that college programs should consider is having their players write up scouting reports for their opponents because it could be it could create 
some sort of institutional knowledge for the team for the following year. Like, you know, so you played three this year, you're playing two now or next year. You know, we want to be able to give that number three player next year the scouting report on who you played yep. so that you have that, you know, you almost like you're creating a library of scouting reports. So that, that could be something. We mentioned in the pre-match routine about setting goals. So we should also reflect on how we did on those goals. So we should come back to that. Um, and I, I would recommend, you know, whether you write about it or just a simple rating system of, of 1 to 10. Um, so that may be something. For some athletes, um, I've done this. And actually, Jim Lair, he was recently on Tim Ferriss' podcast. And he talked about his work with Dan Jansen, the speed skater. Mm -hmm. Um, for, so for some athletes, you may have different performance variables that you're tracking. Um, and they could be anything. It could be hydration. It could be confidence. It could be breathing. Um, and so you may have some performance variables that you want to track and then, and, and then see how you did in a particular match. So th those might be some things. I think one of the, um, the last things I would mention from a mental perspective from a, a post performance is visualization. Now most people will be like, oh, well are you gonna visualize after the match? And and I think we should probably do an episode, Josh, on just visualization and imagery itself. But I think that this could also be another confidence boost is let's use visualization to lock in the good stuff. So create in a way a mental highlight reel from this match of some of the good things that you did. So as you're doing your stretching or your foam rolling or or your rehab, try to play some of that over and over in your head. Most of us probably just do that naturally anyway. Um, but this is a great time to be intentional because then we can really lock that stuff into our brains a little bit more, help us repeat some of that good stuff the next time that we play a match. Yeah, yeah, that, that's a great point. And I think... Again, it depends on the the format um, for you know where how that match takes place. Maybe that um, for in a college setting, you know, you're circling up and doing a, a cool down stretch at the end of the match. Maybe for some players that takes place in the locker room or even on the drive home. Um, but you know, I, I think that's that's definitely an important point to to reinforce what went well. So we're not always um, going through that visualization process of okay, this is what I want to do differently, but it's, it's helping to reinforce and remember really those, those positive moments that we want to replicate over and over again. Yeah. So anything else on the post performance, post match routine, Josh? Um, I mean, I think, I think the, the way that I would, I would end and the way that, um, you know, I, I think starts to, to bring it together, bring it all together is, Philosophically, trying to, um, and I think this this could be its own episode, but um, using uh, a loss or using um, some sort of mistake that you made um, as as a learning experience, and I, I I know that's you know cliche to to a certain extent that you know we want to be learning from our mistakes and learning from our losses, but trying to make that into a habit in itself, trying to make that into a routine, so that we don't end up having so that we don't end up replicating our mistakes. So that if we make a mistake once, um, can we the next time around, you know, not not that we're necessarily going to do everything differently or fix it or it's never going to happen again, but are we at least aware of what the tripping point was last time? And are we making adjustments to try to correct against that, to be aware of that as it's happening? Um, so to try to systemize and make a routine into a, uh, into that constant process of adjusting and trying to learn from from these experiences to um, you know to, to not lose a match in the same way twice where maybe you know you you played a long three set match and it came down to a, a third set tiebreaker and you you reflect back at that match and you felt that hey and on some of those big points I was tight I, I felt I felt tight, um, and how did I respond? I just you know tried to hit the ball as hard as I could and ended up making a bunch of errors. Um, you know, it, you look back at that, and that's going to be you know maybe a tough match to reflect on. But trying to okay, 
if, as you said, Brian, okay, if I were to do that over again, what would have been a better approach there? Could I utilize some mental skills in terms of my routine? Could I incorporate some aspects of breathing? Could I even maybe in, incorporate some progressive muscle relaxation or shake out my arms or uh, hands as I'm, as I'm feeling these, this physical tightness? Um, can I lock into um, that, that playing, that concept of playing loose that Jeff Greenwald has talked about? Uh, maybe it's, this is something we train on the practice court. Um, but, you know, when trying to learn from those mistakes or those experiences that we had, that we've had, and having a clear idea of how we would do it again the next time, because if you're going to keep competing, you're going to be in another third set tiebreaker. You're going to have another high pressure moment where you can utilize these skills and where you can look, where you can um, make gains and benefit from those past experiences. So I think, you know, trying to make that as much um, of a routine as possible. Um, Cause to me as a, as a tennis coach and as a sports psychology professional, you know, if, if I talk to a player who lost their match and they don't even want to talk about it or analyze it in any way, then how can we possibly learn from that experience? How can we possibly make the adjustments needed so that that doesn't happen again? So being able to, in a calm way, think through the match in a non-emotional, um, just simply rational way, you know, think through what went wrong and what we do differently the next time around, because there will be the next time around. And I think one of the keys to helping players like learn from that experience is detaching their say self-worth from the result yep. right they're they're not the same right just just because you lost you're not a loser it's just it's just something that happens a neutral data point we lost this match um nobody died nothing horrible is going to happen here um you're not a terrible person not a terrible player um and so the more that we can sort of separate the experience from the, the identity then it becomes easier Right, we can detach from the result more, and then it becomes more of like a, a project that we can, you know, examine and, and work on. Right. So, well, hopefully, everyone who's listening got a you know a good sense of how routines can help. Um, you know, whether that be before the match, being professional about your preparation during the match. You know, hopefully, um, you know, taking that those steps in between to get yourself 100% physically, mentally, emotionally ready for that next point to raise the quality of your points. And then, you know, after a match, learning from that, reflecting on it, um, building your confidence so you can move forward. Um, So for more on today's show, please check out the show notes. If you have any feedback or questions, especially about these routines, please email us at tennisiqpodcast at gmail.com. You can also use the Twitter hashtag tennisiq. Additionally, please subscribe to the show on your podcast platform of choice, which includes YouTube, so that you can be notified of new episodes. Also, check out our Instagram page where we have new uh, episode notifications. And that is all for today. So thanks again, and we will talk to you soon in our next episode.